Okay, so this is where we left off um, before I got cut off. So I was talking, this this style is Tuscan, down the lower band, and then this one is Ionic, this one is Corinthian, because you can see the Corinthian capitals, capitals, and then these are engaged columns up here, but they are Corinthian uh, capitals. So the two uppermost tiers are Corinthian. And then um, these brackets, I believe, um, either here or here, or maybe both, um, are where I believe they put in wooden poles that would hold up the uh, valerium, which is the huge sheet of um, fabric that shielded the spectators from the sun and rain. And so the practice of decorating a building's facade with a mix of Greek orders and arches is very Roman in design. And it added variety to the surface and it helped to unify, unify the multi-story facade through the use of repetition, much like on the uh, aqueduct we looked at earlier. You know, we have this repetition of, of this arch shape and, and of these column, you know, the vertical lines of the columns. And that just kind of creates unification throughout the many stories. Um, but it's also not boring, you know, they're keeping it, they're mixing it up. And, and like I said earlier, Roman style is very eclectic. It's a mixture of a lot of different styles and it doesn't follow a strict set of rules necessarily like the Greek, um, Greek architecture did or Greek art did. So we'll keep moving on. So we were talking about Vespasian. Um, so he was kind of a down to earth army officer and he really wanted to distance himself from Nero um, the Nero's extravagance. So Nero was the emperor before um, Vespasian and Nero was very extravagant and he eventually got in trouble for that and his spending was kind of out of control and he basically made enemies with a lot of um, people in the government. So um, you know Vespasian wanted to kind of show himself as much more simple and he really broke with the tradition established by Augustus um, as showing the emperor as godlike and never aging, Vespasian kind of goes back to um, the veristic or hyper veristic tradition that was used during the Republic, which was a much more humble time. And that's kind of what he wanted to align himself with. And I think, you know, that was probably a good tactic because um, if he had been extravagant, he probably could have gotten himself killed. So. As you can see with this portrait, it shows him as an older man. He has a receding hairline and wrinkles. And he has a very interesting look on his face too. You know, there's something very sincere and honest and typical about the way that he looks. And it makes you want to trust him somehow. So I think that's probably what he was going for. So this is a portrait of a Flavian woman from Rome, Italy, 90 CE, marble, two feet, one and three eighths inches high. Um, so <clears throat> during the Flavian period, people of all ages were deemed worthy of portraits, unlike the Republic where only older men were deemed worthy. This is a portrait of a Flavian woman and it's pretty simple and its main purpose was to show that the woman was beautiful and fashionable. And she accept, she's actually shows off this popular hairstyle of the day. It's called the Flavian Kofur, or I think that's how you say that, Kofur. And it's it actually has these corkscrew curls that are kind of stacked on top of each other. And the sculptor would have had to use a drill to drill out each one of these uh, corkscrew curls on her head. And actually the use of a drill instead of a chisel became widely used at this point in sculpture. And as you can see, the surface of the sculpture is highly polished and it really makes her skin very smooth and, and it seems to gleam. So here's the East facade of the Arch of Titus in Rome, Italy after 81 CE. So Vespasian died and his son Titus took over, but he only lived to rule for two years. So after his death, his brother Domitian succeeded him and Domitian erected an Arch of Titus um, in his honor on the sacred way leading to the Republican Forum Romana, um, or Romanum, sorry. So this is an example of a triumphal um, triumphal arch, and we've seen these before. This is a very popular Roman thing that they did, and they would make these arches to 
kind of uh, show off, you know, a variety of events, sometimes victories, um, sometimes the building of built um, bridges and roads, they would put up arches. And typically they had bronze statuary on top of them. And engaged columns would typically frame the singular arched opening. So you can see this one has Corinthian style, although there's a mixture here, and I'll, I'll get into that here. Um, so the capitals on this particular engaged set of engaged columns are not Greek at all. They're actually a mix of Ionic volutes, so that scroll shape, um, and also the Corinthian acanthus leaves. So this is really um, an interesting mix. And it's uniquely Roman, and it's actually called a composite capital because it's mixing the Ionic volute with the Corinthian acanthus leaves. So it's something that was never used before. Um, and the Romans made this up, and it's called a composite capital. And there is a dedicatory um, or a, a, an inscription on the top that states that the Senate erected the arch to honor the god Titus, who was the son of the god Vespasian. So typically, after an emperor died, they became a god. And so that's kind of what is, you know, etched up here on the top of the arch. Okay, we'll keep moving. This is another, this is still off the arch of Titus, but it's just a relief panel in the vault of the passageway. And it's called the Apotheosis of Titus, and at the center of the vault in the passageway, and it shows Titus ascending to heaven, and Apotheosis means ascent to heaven. Most emperors were declared gods after they died. Some, like Nero, were not. So if, typically, if you became an enemy of the, you know, state, or so to say, um, they kind of went down as um, tyrants, like Nero did. Um, and typically, you know, if you were a if you were a emperor like Nero, your name would have been essentially erased from public inscriptions. Um, Okay, we'll take another look at another relief off of the Arch of Titus. And this is the Spoils of Jerusalem. It's a relief panel in the passageway of the Arch of Titus. And it's basically, you know, a relief panel showing Roman soldiers carrying the spoils of war after the conquest of Judea. Um, the fight was actually called the Jewish War. And you can see they're carrying this seven-branched candelabrum or menorah right here. Um, and there's a lot of movement in this piece, and the parade is actually does seem to be moving quite quickly. Um, you know, it's capturing a lot of bo bodies in motion. And it's done in high relief, which uh, produces strong shadows, and many parts have broken off because it is in such high relief. The higher the relief, the more likelihood there is of, of pieces breaking off from it. So this one does have some damage. <clears throat> And on the other side of the Arch of Titus, um, it's another relief panel in the passageway. Uh, it shows Titus in his triumphal chariot. And while the other panel was a documentary of actual events, this one shows a more fantastical scene. Um, so Victory, she has wings. I think she's right here. Um, she rides with Titus in the four horse chariot and she places a wreath on his head and below her is a bare-chested youth who is probably the personification of honor, I believe right here, and a female personification of valor leads the horses. And so the intermingling of divine and human characters is really unique because this is the first time this has happened on an official Roman historical relief. And soon after, the interaction between mortals and immortals will become a staple of Roman narrative relief sculpture, um, even in, on monuments in honor of emperors while they're still alive. So this is kind of the first of, of many to come that show the interaction of, of mortals with immortals. And so these were actually done after Titus had died, but moving forward, emperors will actually still be alive when they have um, narrative relief done of them interacting with immortals. So um, kind of kind of an interesting piece for that fact, really. And I'm going to stop the video here and start up in the next video with the High Empire.